The United Kingdom certainly doesn't lack ambition when it comes to infrastructure. Major projects are regularly announced, from high-speed railways to new metro lines to upgrades of aging networks. But it is becoming a bit of a trend that projects often arrive years late and billions over budget. And that's if they even get completed at all. High Speed 2, for example, is undoubtedly a very ambitious project that will provide some much needed capacity to some of Britain's busiest rail corridors. But the price of the project has absolutely ballooned, from around £50 billion in the early days of the project to over £100 billion today. This causes some very real problems. Of course, these budget overruns don't help the country's finances, but as we saw with HS2 where the northern half of that line got canned, it can often lead to projects getting scaled back or cancelled. And now, even with that cancelled leg, costs are still spiralling upwards. This all brings me to the question, why does building transport infrastructure in the UK take longer and cost more than in many other places? Well, in this video, I'm going to look into just that, to understand how the country's planning system has become so complex, so cautious and so politically unstable that delivering infrastructure on time and at scale is becoming almost impossible, and what plans there might be to fix that. Hi all, I'm City Moose and I make videos about transport, urbanism and planning, so if that sounds interesting to you, consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to support the channel, do check out my Ko-fi, I always greatly appreciate it. Back to the UK's infrastructure challenges though, and one of the first obstacles is space. The UK is one of the most densely populated countries in Europe, England itself has a population density not too far off India's, and that all means transport corridors often have to squeeze through existing neighbourhoods, alongside protected landscapes or beneath expensive real estate. Even when land is available, the ownership can be deeply fragmented, so building a single mile of railway might mean negotiating with dozens of private landowners, each with legal rights and the potential to delay a project. This all means that disputes over compensation are common, and while the government might have compulsory purchase powers, using them is rarely straightforward, and they often result in drawn-out appeals, legal battles or political pushback. This is particularly apparent in the public consultation phase basically every project needs to go through. This consultation phase is a very noble idea as it means that people get to have a voice in how their communities are shaped, especially when projects affect their homes, landscapes or ecosystems. But while it does add some transparency to the planning process, it can also massively slow it down, and it's not rare for the public consultation phases of various projects to take multiple years, as they usually involve multiple rounds including initial scoping, public feedback plus revisions, and sometimes a full public inquiry. Now, while researching this video, I've been making use of an app you may or may not already be familiar with called Readly. It gives me access to like 8,000 different magazines and newspapers, which has made the process of finding information and case studies a lot easier. Especially for this video, it really helped me broaden my horizons when it comes to both the pros and cons of the public consultation process in the UK. For example, there was an article from the Huddersfield Daily Examiner, which is not a paper I would typically check as part of my standard research process, that details how, quote unquote, environmental campaigners used concerns about peatlands in Yorkshire to delay the construction of a wind farm that had the potential to cut CO2 emissions by up to 354,000 tonnes each year. On the other hand, sometimes public consultation can have some quite positive impacts. In this article from Cambridge News about the East-West Rail project, that's going to be creating a direct rail link between Cambridge and Oxford, a third round of public consultation resulted in the addition of a new station to the line that should help connect even more communities to it, as well as upgrades to Cambridge Station being included in the project which will allow for better service frequencies. That said, those consultations also resulted in things like part of the line now being put in a tunnel, which will undoubtedly increase costs. Beyond the consultations with the public, major infrastructure projects also have to deal with various government stakeholders as well. These can be councils, national agencies, regulators and more. Again, we can see why there's good reason for this. If a project puts an important ecosystem at risk, we do probably want an environmental agency to let us know. But, of course, this very often slows projects down. We can see a very recent example of this in this article from The Standard on the pedestrianisation of Oxford Street which seems like a bit of a no-brainer to me, but despite the project having massive public support, it's been held back by Westminster Council. 
You can also have situations where these various organizations aren't exactly aligned, which can cause even more issues. With Readly, I'm able to go back and check out old issues of various publications, like this article from Rail Magazine from over a decade ago, where planning permission was granted to an apartment development, even though it was on land that was earmarked for the route of HS2. Now, the existence of various stakeholders is hardly a UK-specific issue, but much like with the public consultations, some say there are too many of them and they are often given too much power. In fact, that is something the current government is actively targeting with upcoming planning reforms. The Housing Secretary is hoping to streamline the planning process by allowing local authority planning officers the ability to rubber stamp development proposals. This will be based on having a set of locally agreed plans and regulations that, as long as they are complied with, the proposals won't have to deal with getting approvals from countless council committees. For the time being, these changes, if they go through, will mostly be focused on the development of housing, which is a good thing in its own way, but as part of a broader package of reforms to the planning system, well, the government is hoping to halve the amount of time major infrastructure projects, like railways for example, spend in the statutory pre-consultation period, from the current average of two years to just one. If they do manage to do this, it should hopefully help get projects done faster and cheaper, but we will have to wait and see if that actually happens. But even without these various authorities and regulators, the nature of Britain's politics also creates another risk, through political instability. Because these infrastructure projects can take so long, they often span multiple government terms, and these governments can sometimes disagree on infrastructure priorities. Hopping back to Readly, this article I've bookmarked from the Daily Express about the plans to build a third runway at Heathrow really demonstrates this. The project was first proposed in 2003, but when the government changed in 2010, the plans were scrapped, but now, with another new government, they're back on the table again. Sometimes you don't even need to change the ruling party, as we've seen plenty of times with HS2, like here from Rail Magazine, where HS2 was apparently meant to be the catalyst for Lee's rejuvenation, but I think we all know how that turned out, with the same party that proposed the branch to Leeds also being the one to cancel it. And while that part of the project was cancelled to save money, these changes to projects often require redesigns or paying contractors cancellation fees, so often aren't as cost-saving as you might expect them to be. The issue with changing government priorities is not an easy one to fix, the UK is a democracy after all and government changes will happen, but I do think if projects generally got faster and cheaper, well, one, they would run over fewer government terms which would reduce the opportunities for them to get cancelled, but two, they would also be more politically popular, which would also help keep them alive. Beyond that, it's really been this issue of Rail Magazine I read the other day that got me thinking about what they call the gold plating of rail projects in the UK. I think from a political standpoint, governments want their new projects to be shiny and fancy, but this excess can often make these projects more expensive and time consuming than they need to be. Coming back to HS2 for an example, this project does seem to have a lot of examples of escalating costs. The article in Rail Magazine specifically calls out the decision to build the line for a top speed of 400 km an hour, which is over 100 km an hour more than the international norm, as a top reason for the project's high cost. I mean, yeah, it would be cool if it went that quickly, but it really isn't necessary to have such high speeds to unlock the benefits of the project, which have always been more about capacity anyway. On top of all of this, there are these sometimes quite excessive safety margins projects in the UK need to accommodate. Now, of course, safety is very important, but at times, the safety standards in UK projects often exceed those seen in other countries, where their lack of such standards doesn't seem to be causing them all that much of a problem. The Channel Tunnel is kind of notorious for its very intense safety requirements. I recently did a video on the plans for the tunnel to be used to create new international routes from London to places like Switzerland, but one of the things holding them back from doing that, as we can see here in Rail Express magazine, are the incredibly strict safety requirements in the tunnel. The final point I'll make about planning in the UK is around standardisation. If we compare the approach the UK takes with its infrastructure to many countries in mainland Europe, we'll see that a lot of other countries take a more standardised approach. This article from Money Week magazine looks at just this, and how, by taking a modular approach to its stations, the Madrid Metro was able to be built for quote, half the cost and twice the speed of industry averages. 
This is because by taking this modular approach, they were able to achieve an economy of scale where they could reuse repetitive structures to keep the construction simple. In the UK, by contrast, it seems each new project needs to reinvent the wheel. So ultimately, I don't think there's one key issue you can single out for why the UK has been struggling so much to build infrastructure in recent years. Instead, it's a mixture of a number of failings in the planning system, including innate geographical ones like the fact that the UK is one of the most densely populated countries in Europe, policy ones that result in very drawn out consultation phases with various interest groups, regulators and local communities that often see project plans rewritten multiple times, as well as political ones that see projects started by one government, cancelled or changed by the next. And to top that all off, the lack of standardization creates a lot of redundant work that just slows the whole thing down. Thankfully, it looks like the British government is aware of this and is trying to implement a series of reforms to the planning system. But only time will tell if these will be enough and whether they will actually address all of the issues. In my view, it is very important that they do. Britain's population is growing fast and the country is going to need its infrastructure to keep up. And that's only going to be able to happen if the pace of infrastructure construction increases significantly. Now, throughout this video, I found that using Readly has given me access to a huge variety of magazines and newspapers that have greatly helped me do my research for it. The app has let me access over 8,000 different publications, some of which are infrastructure related but really do cover all sorts of topics. And personally, I found it really useful to be able to go back and look at older issues of these publications, one, just because it's interesting, but it was also a great way to compare how infrastructure projects have worked in the past compared to now. If you want to give Readly a try, they are currently offering a two month free trial. You can scan this QR code if you want to check it out. Otherwise, I'll just put a link at the top of this video's description. Also, if you enjoyed the video and want to see more like it, consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. And if you want to support the channel, check out my Kofi, it is always greatly appreciated. With that all said, I'm Kyle, aka City Moose, and as always, thanks for watching.